evening, and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings the Constitution, the news, and politics into one location. That's your living room. Mark, what are we covering tonight? Well, first of all, Jim, now Law Talk is on Facebook. So we want everyone to go to facebook.com forward slash Law Talk TV show and take a look and make a comment or befriend us or whatever. Yeah, I noticed that we actually have access to the shows uh, through that website. Isn't that correct? Well, yeah, if you go through YouTube, we have a, you know, through Facebook, go to YouTube, we have a few sh shows on YouTube. So okay, so that way if you missed any of the shows, you can go back and kind of look them up. Well, right? we have some more that we need to load on there, but we've got a few up on there. Okay, Mark, so what are we covering tonight? Well, there's a, um, a state and tax cliff coming up on January 1st, 200, uh, 2013. What kind of cliff is that, Mark? Well, what happened is there was a political showdown in Congress and the, between the president. What they, they decided is we're going to push everything off to after the election, right? Oh, you're talking, well, isn't this what happened in 210 when it was the sundown of the Bush tax cuts? So isn't that when it came up? Well, I don't really think that there's such a thing as a tax cut myself. Okay. I think people honestly earn money, and then where constitutionally applicable, the, the government can tax that. But uh, there's really no such thing as a tax cut. I mean, people earn the money, they own that money, and in certain conditions under the enumerated clauses, the government has a right to tax them, but there's really no such thing as a tax well, cut. Well, I, I mean, it starts out as the earner's money. If I remember correctly, <laughs> this country was started to abolish taxes, and there's nothing really in the Constitution that allows taxation. It's a, the taxation started as an administrative action, and so when we talk about uh, a constitutional right to tax people out of their hard-earned money, it doesn't really exist. So well, the, in, the, in, the, in the numerate clauses, it talks about tariffs and import tariffs and, and excise taxes. So there's, there's, there is taxation. Does in, it talk in, about the income tax? No, it does not. Does it talk about the state tax? No, it does not. Does it talk about real property tax? No, it does not. So those are taxes that, were, that are being applied to us that don't really have a rational basis in the Constitution. But under the uh, living Constitution. The living, the living constitution. <laughs> you have the necessary property, okay, which is a catch-all of anything uh, that you can you can come up with as long as you have the votes to do it. So what we've been told all these years on taxation is it's necessary and proper to tax the people for their hard-earned money, so that we ensure that the government can operate to provide for those people that don't want to work up with and earn hard-earned money. No, no, the necessary proper cause just basically says whoever's in power. Can do whatever, can do whatever they, they want. They want. <laughs> okay, but really, okay, so, the, so basically what it comes down, January 1st, 2013, um, estate taxes have an exemption of $5 million per person. That's currently. Yeah, lifetime exemption. But uh, January 1st, coming up in a few, couple of months, that's going to go, well, actually, right now it's $5,120,000 because there were some adjustments for inflation. But that means that if anything, that number and below is not a taxable it's exempt. On, a, on the estate tax. When it means you inherit it, you don't have to pay a tax on it. That's correct. Okay. Now, that's going to drop down to a million dollars on January 1st. That's a dramatic drop. Yeah, and the thing is, people go, well, if someone's got $5 million, I mean, you know, if you're an Occupy Wall Street person, well, those people, we should just kill them and take all their money. And that would be the fair, that would be fair. But if you killed everybody, all the rich people, like you're 1%, and you took all their money, it would only run the government for you know a period of weeks you know, Wait, so. it would, where are we talking about this is six days it yeah, would yeah, run the government yeah, that means the, that, the that government. would be all the money taken yeah. from all the people that are classified in the yeah 1%. so i mean you can't really you know so what i'm saying that's one viewpoint is that no one should inherit anything right yeah but that means if you if you if you die right and your family is you've raised them from small children, and you want to pass your wealth on to them. That's unfair. That's not fair. That's unfair. But who's not fair? Who's it not fair for? Well, the thing about it is not fair for the people who don't have rich parents. So that's unfair. And so that's, that's you know, one of the good things about this. You know, as far as Occupy Wall Street, they, you shouldn't be able to pass anything. It should be 100% death tax. And that, at this point, it's going from $5 million to $1 million. People go, $5 million, that's a lot of money. But let's say you have a family business. $5 million. Or you own a ranch or, or a farm. A ranch or a, you know, apartment building or something like that. That's what right. you put your life's work in and you want right. to pass that on to your kids. Um, you know, you can be in that area of money. Well, you could be right there. Just to, It's not even cash in the bank. It could just be or a, you have a, a nice piece of real property. You have a nice house in San Francisco. And that would be it. But see, that makes it fairly, un you know, that makes it very unfortunate because oftentimes people can't pay those taxes. If it's, if, if say, the, the sundown actually happens and it drops from $5 million to $1 million, 
and you have a property that's worth $3 million, and you have to pay taxes on the $3 million. Because not only is it a sundown on the $5 million to $1 million, well, wait, it gets but it better. also ra- it, it gets better. It's so better. we're talking about raising the percentage uh, as well. And it, it's not only, the, okay, not only does it go from $5,120,000 to a million, but it also goes from uh, 35% up to 55%. <laughs> so <laughs> That's taxes, a lot of money, taxes Mark. Taxes going up. So there's a lot of things you have to do. Yep. You can inherit a property, and then how are you going to pay the tax on it? You have to sell the property. Well, and there's other things you could do if you did proper estate planning. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, you could, you could take out life insurance on the, on the person who holds the property now, and then that life insurance policy could maybe cover those taxes. You could form a family limited partnership. There's certain things you could do with different trusts, certain things you could do with LLCs, limited liability companies. So there's lots of things do you, you could do. Do you want to give me an example on how a, uh, a limited family partnership would help us? Okay, a family limited partnership could be set up like this. It's rather uh, complex in some ways, but it's an interesting uh, vehicle, in, uh, investment and in, in, uh, in estate vehicle. You could set up the limited partnership. Those could be the parents, for example, right? And then the general partners could be all the children. So okay. let's say, just for example, you had, you know, five kids and 15 grandchildren or something like that, right? So, and then you had a $5 million property that made a 10% profit every year. So you're making $500,000 a year in profit. You know, you could right now get your husband and wife together and they could each have a $13,000 per year gift exemption, right? Right. Combine that husband and wife, you have 26000 Now this is apart from your $5 million. And every year, if you have 20 kids, you could... You know, give literally them give away five hundred twenty thousand amount without without a taxation issue. Yeah, five hundred twenty thousand right, dollars a year. You can do that for over many years. Right. And that way, you know, the kids would be limited partners, so they couldn't go and squander the money right. until such time as you could put in the agreement. You know, they maybe after they're thirty-five or forty-five, they can attack the trust or whatever. Right. And uh, that would be a way of you know transferring wealth to the next generation. Right. So you could have a spendthrift clause in there, right. so the kids don't have the opportunity to really spend the money as fast as they it may be earned but also you're avoiding the taxation issue by by under the gift exemption right so you're giving each of the beneficiaries gifts that are below the gift exemption so that means there's no taxation issue on that and so what happens next is the actually say the parents in this case were are giving away their their ownership interest at some level but they're but the ultimately there's still going to be a number at the end of time when both parents are gone and it's going to have to actually pass to the ben- next level of beneficiary okay, so what yeah. happens at that point okay well there's so you know there's a fair amount of uh, debate on that you know between trusts and wills and ab trusts and certain exempted things um but uh what you what, what you're going to end up one of the nuances of a family limited partnership is that let's say you have a, a million dollar uh piece of property right right now, but if, if you have a shared ownership, the value of that property decreases because you don't have control, right? Let's say you have a piece of property, right? Mm-hmm. And But you, let's say you have a piece of property, you own it with your two brothers. Or, correct, okay? correct. Well, In some kind of limited partnership. In some kind of li- now, you don't have control. If you want to sell it, your brother may not want to sell it, or the other right, one might want right. to sell it for a different price. Right. So the fact that you lose some amount of control on that and some kind of li- liquidity, that devalues that property somewhat. Well, like a depreciation. It's a certain amount of depreciation. Depreciation allowance. So in a certain way, you can that, that also comes into play in your family limited partnership okay. because you have your splitting it among, amongst your siblings. or So there is some, some you get some tax credit there. Correct. So there you go. So those are, those are some of the ways you can do it. But wait a minute. What's, what's going to be the alternative? The alternative is going to be that when January 1st, 2013 comes around, they extend the so-called Bush tax cuts. And they actually allow this uh, current estate program to go forward. What do you think the odds are on that? Well, like I said, I don't believe in the terminology of a tax cut. I don't. I don't believe it's such a thing. Right. I mean, people earn money. The government taxes where it's constitutionally uh, uh, able to do so, but you can't really have a tax cut. I mean, it's, okay. it's you know. But anyway, um, you can say you can say there's an absence of a tax, but I, you know, or the absence of a raise. But what we would say if this is going to change. You know, it depends on which party wins. If, okay. if, if, you know, if you have the Republican Party win, you know, they, they, they may re- remain the same. If the Democrats win, it'll probably be reduced. Whether it'll go down to a million or maybe it'll be two or three million, it'll probably be reduced. Okay, well, why don't we, why don't we uh, cover this? Because you know what? January 1st is going to be coming up, and we're going to find out what happened in the election during our next show. So why don't we leave that, and let's move to our second topic. What's that tonight? Oh, okay. Well, that's uh, Dodd-Frank. 
Wait a minute, Dodd Frank. Would that be Chris Dodd and Barney Frank? Well, those are the, you know some real great guys, and they, what they're doing is they're looking out for the little guy. They're looking they're out for the little like, guy. Looking out for you the know, guy. I've always heard that. <laughs> yeah, I heard Chris Dodd's always guy. looking out for the little guy. But the little guy is usually the little guy at his bank account where he's hoping to. Yeah. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, the Dodd Frank bill. What isn't that something that was passed as a reaction to the the banking industry failures that happened in 2007, 2008? Well, there was some, you know, there were some scandals. There was some crisis in the banking industry, and people were upset because they said, "Well, look, you know, we've lost our houses, we've lost our fortunes, and yet some of these bankers getting out with golden parachutes." Right. Well, and they, so playing on that sentiment and that emotion, yeah. um, they went in and really, basically, as a, like a judge would say, the, the banking industry got a spanking. They did get a spanking, and what what it what it was was because the banks had been dealing in the derivatives of the home mortgage business. And I, we covered this in one of our right, earlier right. shows. Uh, the derivatives that were put together by a variety of bundled. mortgages, they were, they were bundled with mortgages that were all cut up into pieces, then put together in derivatives, and then traded like some kind of stock product right. between banks. And that's where the, a lot of the banks went under because they were they were overloaded with these derivatives that well, actually the, had the, no value. Well, the question wasn't that they didn't have a value, but when they're asked for the valuations, there's no way to. The valuations were treated. They were, okay, when they're asked the valuation, they say, well, how many of these bets, what's your percentage of bad bets in this bundle, right? And they said, well, our percentage of bad bets in this bundle is 15. It was really about 18 or 21 or somewhere. So there was like right, a 3 to right. three to 6% wow factor, yow factor yeah. in there, that when it turned out, no, it wasn't really 15, it was 6%. Well, when you leverage all these things, because you got to understand when a bank gets money, you know, from the Federal Reserve, and they leverage things, they don't... They make loans. They don't have money in their bank to cover all those loans. No, so, they don't. So they when have you to borrow money, so, they, so but I mean, they're leveraged. You know, they're right. they're allowed to right. loan more than they have, and right. so you know, when you have six percent, that becomes a huge crisis. Correct. Right. Huge. And well, anyway, let's let's go back on Dodd Frank because I actually have a note here on uh, what the Dodd Frank bill did. It created a financial stability oversight council. Now that council is made up by the voting members, which consists of the head of the treasury. The Federal Reserve, the OCC, the SEC, the F CFTC, and the FDIC, FHFA, and NCUA. Now, that sounds like an alphabet soup, but what it really is is a group of all the organizations that run the financial, all the financial monitoring in the country. Well, the government group. The government group. So These it, are all government yeah, well, groups. Like and so, of course, these are appointees as well. No, They're no, unelected no, no, officials. No, but it's like in the old days you had a king and they appointed dukes. They appointed days. the dukes. So these are basically like dukes. That's right. Okay, and so you have one duke that's in charge of, you know, what you can say, what you can't say, and then you have one duke in charge of your energy costs. Right. And now this is a duke in charge of the money. So, and what's interesting about this... Um, they're the uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Oh, the but Protection what, Bureau. But the funny thing about the consumer, the consumer has no redress <laughs> against the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. If he the sues consumer in, has no redress no, on no, any he, of this. He goes, there's no judicial review. Correct. And if, if like, Unelected say, officials. There's unelected officials. So the CFBA says, look, okay, this bank, right, we got to liquidate it. We're going to fold it. This bank's going down. We're going to take it out, right? And you have an investment in this, right? You, the, and you're on appeal, doesn't matter. It doesn't make any they, difference. They, 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 you lose. And, okay, you can't go to a judge and say, under your Fifth Amendment due process clause, you can't say. There is no due process. There's no due process. You can't, you can't say, is this constitutional? And, the, and, the, and the, the catchphrase is here is like, um, it is to uh, necessary to, uh, what is it, necessary to, uh, if it's a, the, firm, the, the firms propose a threat to the financial system. So if it's necessary to, uh, to, to preserve the financial system, these people have complete control. Yeah, but complete see, but they wait, have as much control. Part of that complete they control. have as much control as, you know, a Soviet czar of anything. Yeah, well, the control. worst part about this is um, the, the Dodd-Frank set up so many things like stress tests and what they, how they control transactions between the banks and how they loan money even to small businesses and individuals and the, the, the paperwork that goes into qualifying anyone for any kind of loan. The problem is what they've done is they put all these pressures onto the bank that they're saying, we're going to monitor all this. And the banks are worried about, well, wait a minute. You know, we really don't, we, we want to make sure we have more money than we need. So that means we're not going to loan the money that we borrow. And currently, the borrowing rate for most of these banks is 0%. Right. So they don't even want to loan it, even if you can get 3%, because they're saying, whoa, we want to be, be able to pass the uh, Dodd-Frank stress test 
which says that we're a strong bank and that we can live, we can go on. Right. But the worst part is they aren't an individual. They're a, they're, a, they're a publicly traded organization where shareholders are maybe making a profit, but how can a shareholder make a profit if there's no loans? Well, not only that, how does a shareholder, you know, it's, okay, under the, you know, there's supposed to be a guaranteed uniform bankruptcy laws, right? Right. This circumvents that. A completely okay. circumvents that. That circumvents the bankruptcy laws. Bankruptcy laws, constitutional protection of the bankruptcy law, forget about it. Fifth Amendment, forget about it. This rolls right over that. But wait a minute, isn't this go along with a too big to fail argument that, oh, some banks, if we say this, they pass the stress test and they're handling so much of the monetary reserves in our country today that they're too big to fail, that means the government will back them no matter oh, yeah, what yeah. they well, do. They basically become a Fannie Mae, you know, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae. Basically, they become GSAs, government supported, or GSEs, sorry, government supported enterprises, where they're basically a socialized bank. And you know, like GM, oh, government mortars. That sounds whatever. like a lot like redistribution. So, so where's that going? So that's what that's what you've got there. But uh, the big thing about this is like what's necessary to preserve the financial system. That's completely up to the Treasury Secretary, and no one can second guess him. No citizen, no you know, it, it, you can't touch him. No, the Supreme Court can't say anything. Federal, nobody can say anything. This the only is, thing we can do about him is make sure his boss is kicked out of power <laughs> during the next election. Well, Isn't I'm, that the only option you have for a Treasury Secretary? Well, he's an appointee. He's appointee. He's an appointee. So I guess Unelected I, official. Well, so he's like a duke. He's, you know, a, he's duke. a duke. He's a duke. Is he of the that, Duke of Earl? Of that fiefdom, right? And, that, and that's in charge of all the money, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, but who's he, our current secretary? I, uh, who's our, I can't even think of it right now. <laughs> you don't that's, want to. But, you know why? Uh, he should be indicted. Uh, that's not... Uh, is it, was, uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Forget it. No, I'm sorry. But anyway, here's the deal. What, what's going on now is that all this came out of whatever the banking nightmare was, allegedly during the Bush administration. So they have two Democrats, by the way, Dodd-Frank, who are both, by the way, le leaving power. They're no longer uh, in any kind of office because of one reason or another. But the fact of the matter is they pass a banking bill that suppressed the economy. And for the last three and a half years since this bill was passed, the economy has been heavily suppressed because banks can't loan because they're worried about the stress test that is coming down from the government. I guess, I don't know if they have monthly reporting, quarterly reporting, but the fact of the matter is that the banks are worried. They won't loan well, money, and that's stymies business. Well, the thing about it is, for example, you could say, what's a qualified mortgage? Well, that's a good question, because no one here knows. Two years into it, nobody knows what a qualified mortgage is, okay? You know, is it expected to be repaid, you know? Okay, so, and then you've got someone looking over you and saying, well, you've got to only do what qualified mortgages, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't do it right, then we'll liquidate you. Okay, yeah, but well, what, I don't but, know about but, liquidation. But there's I, no, there's no really no guidelines for what a qualified mortgage is. Now, you know, the counter argument to that is from the Dodd Frank people. They say, well, it's not retroactive, so you could do whatever you want, and we wouldn't be able to get you later. Except, except now it's a completely vague rule. Right. That's completely arbitrary. So nobody knows. So okay, well, right. let's, as far as Dodd-Frank, that could take us months to discuss because of the complicated law, but we have one more subject to cover today, and I believe this is a, a campaign gaffe by, uh, by uh, Governor Mitt Romney, uh, which effectively has taken the country by storm and is being well publicized as a, as a reason to believe he's unfit to hold office. And so what was that gap? Well, see, Romney was wrong. He said 47% of the people uh, in the United States, citizens of the United States, don't pay income tax or make more from the government than they give the government. If you really, oh, wait a minute. Are you talking about people that work or people that don't work? It's just anybody. You know, but he's Everybody. saying more people, more people get, more, get more from the government than they give to it. Oh, okay. you mean people that don't pay taxes? Well, they could pay, I'm just saying, he's saying 40% are net gainers, right? 40% or 47 47%. Okay. But if you really look at, but he was wrong. He was completely he's wrong. He's wrong. Yeah, because if you look at the numbers, there's about 165 million Americans are at least partially dependent on financial benefits, right? That's 165 that million. That sounds like over half. And there's about, well, no, and then there's about 107 million on welfare. This is according to uh, Senator Jeff Sessions, Alabama. And when you add those numbers up, it comes about 53%. Oh. So actually, 47% is wrong. 53% uh, is really close to the number. Um, so, but, so if you're just talking numbers, he was wrong about that. But anyway, the gap, I think the gap is it related to that number. They said 47, maybe it is 53. And I, I, I do remember Jeff Sessions did bring this up and did have this broken out. 
but I believe the gaffe was that uh, uh, Governor Romney had indicated that he wouldn't even really be campaigning to those people because he felt they were already in Obama's pocket, well, President Obama's pocket. You know, Romney took this back. He said it was a mistake. Yeah, he took it back. He took it back. He says it was a mistake. <laughs> I should have said the cow was out of the barn, but yeah, I'm going to yeah, take yeah, it back yeah, in the yeah. barn. <laughs> so he says, you know, he, he was sorry about that. He, oh, he's sorry he about didn't, that. Didn't. But I think, uh, I, I think what he was doing, he was saying, you know, where are we going to concentrate our, our, our campaign, campaign, re yeah. campaign resources? And since Romney is an old-fashioned guy, right, and he's kind of silly. He believes in capitalism, which nobody whoa, really... Whoa, whoa, nobody capitalism! Really, nobody really believes Wait a minute, that. that's a magic word. That, that's actually a bit on the... It's almost like the four-letter word list for the last three and a half years. No, no, no. Capitalism but, doesn't exist. No, but that's for old-fashioned people. And, oh, and, and he old believes he people. believes that, you know, if, if, if you invest in something... Yeah. But he doesn't believe... See, he believes in the old-fashioned idea of investment. What's that? The old-fashioned idea of this, like, is if you, like, say, if you put money into something mm -hmm. or put effort into something... Right. And then you profited from that... Right. Or you could take a loss out of that. Yeah. You either have a return on investment or a loss of investment, and you would have an investment that you would take a profit. But that sounds like traditional capitalism. Well, but that's that doesn't. But that's, that's not the that's, way it goes. No, now. that's not how you make Wait money. Wait a minute, is that is that's, there a different word they no, use no, now no. called? Oh no no no, investment's oh, different. No, no, no investment. investment's different. Oh, okay. So you don't have investment by earning something or by right. in, by taking capital and putting it in something. The way that you make money now is like you raise taxes. That's a great way of making money, or you can print money. Oh. Or you can borrow money. So well, that's 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 the new kind of investment. Well, wait that's, a minute. Let's take kind of, those one at a time. That's how you invest. When you talk now. about printing money, who's in charge of that? Is that Bernanke? Yeah, yeah that's Bernanke. Yeah, he's Bernanke. the one that decides whether we should print some. So print. So that's the that's the popular way of making. And they call that quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two. And now they have quantitative easing three. But that's not three. capitalism. That's that's an inflationary action. No, that's making money. Oh, making money. Under Literally the new, making under money. Under the new. Yeah, that's under the new. The new, the yeah, new the new regime making money. Yeah, this making is, money. That's the new type of investment. Ah, got and Then it. you take that money. Okay, and then you have taxes. Okay, let's well, say for taxes. every, every say you raise taxes by a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look statistically, what a government does when it takes in a, the U.S. government and all the governments in, in, in the U.S. when they take in a dollar, they always spend two point six dollars. But for how every does dollar. that add up in a year when you want to do a budget? How does well, that even add up? Well, it's kind of like having a credit card. See, the taxes are used to pay the minimum payment the on your credit, credit card. Credit card, you're limited, so you can borrow more. But how can you borrow more when you have a limited on the credit you, card? You go to your creditors and you borrow more. And who do you borrow more from? China. China! So you borrow is, money wait from a China. minute, is that like the mascot visa of yeah, uh, yeah, the U.S. Yeah. government is China? Oh, okay. So that's the new way. So Romney's old-fashioned is antiquated. Oh, no one believes in that forget. capitalism stuff anymore. You mean earning money is the old-fashioned yeah, old way. It doesn't exist investment. anymore. Investment. No one calls that investment anymore. Oh, so the, the, new, the, way new, the, 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 the new, new investment is like you would, you would tax Peter right, right. to pay Paul. Right. And then you can always depend on Paul's vote. That's the new investment. Oh, you can depend on Paul's vote because you're giving Paul money. Right. You take That's, it for Peter, yeah, Peter you, who earned it and through the old-fashioned way, yeah. and you give it to Paul, yeah. and then Paul says, I'm going to vote for you, so and I'm going to put print money as much into your you campaign. You can print as much as you can. And, and Paul's saying, yeah. please print more. Yeah. So please borrow more. So that's how it works. And what happens? So China decides they're going to keep lending more. Yeah. But the problem is, isn't there a point where the value of the currency that's actually being generated by printing and by loans uh, but makes the economy fall apart because there's insufficient funds to, to run the government. But what's the because of the inflationary factor? But the beauty of that. The is beauty. The, the beauty of that is it's actually a hidden tax. A uh, hidden tax. Because How's a hidden tax? Well, because the price, price of bread and the price of gas uh, goes up. The inflationary so, tax. So people go, oh, those dang people, those dang capitalists are raising the price of gas and they're raising the price of bread. Which, in fact, the, the, the currency is actually being devaluated because you're printing more, right? Right. And because the monetary policy. Right. But you can blame the people who are selling it. But that's making it the new way. You're you can, just printing it. But you can blame the people who are selling you the gas. Oh, then you blame it, them. Yeah, it's their fault. They can't, and, they can't make a profit. And then you can take away their tax cuts. Oh, their tax cuts. Take away their tax cuts and tax uh, them more. Because so they're, getting, they're making too much money. Because they're making too much money. And they've already earned enough. Because... Like a, two years ago, you could get a gallon of gas for a buck fifty, and now it's three or four bucks, right? Right. So well, no, evil, actually, in, in where we live now, it's, it's five. almost five bucks. Okay, but the point is that's because the evil gas companies. The evil gas it's companies. It's got nothing to the fact that our currency has been deflated, devalued. Devalued. So that's the beauty of it. You but can, there's another problem. Yeah. But we could get into that on a different show, and that's more of the uh, the fact that refineries aren't being allowed to be built. Right. There's a, a, a strong environmental basis that says that we have to have a specific mix of gasoline in California. And then on top of that, we aren't alternative, drilling. Alternative, alternative we energy. don't have any alternative energy. And last time I saw, there's no cars that are run by solar, and there's no cars run by wind. Maybe that works on a lake with your little... 
ten foot boat, but it sure doesn't work on the okay. highways. Okay, and the other thing about that fifty three percent number, it's yeah. also a little bit low. Because you also have government employees, which is maybe 20% of the population. Oh, so when but you that's really all are, union, too. So, but when you all look hey, at are it... Are we bringing the unions back into no, this no, again? No, I'm, I'm just saying you're actually in like a 67% of people are dependent on the government. Well, how, why would any of those people vote for Romney, then? What's that? They wouldn't. Then, they, then what does that mean? Is the election foregone conclusion? Well, I'm saying that they may, under certain, certain situations, if they, if, they if they think, well, maybe we can only borrow and maybe we can only spend so far, so long. But well, you mean there, mean there might be some realists in that 53 or 55 percent that says or maybe to, I should to, uh, vote for a real capitalist? 67. Or 67 percent. But that's not to say that, you know, in this 47 percent and these 67, they're, they're hardworking people, right? But they yeah, are A lot of them are hardworking people. Yeah, hardworking, and, and maybe they're on Social Security. Maybe they work we're very veterans. hard. We're veterans. Yeah, veterans. So they, they, they earn that money, and they're getting they, their government. But they government. earned it because they getting, worked for They're getting that government. They're getting that government and those, money. Those are the people that Romney insulted when he made this comment. Yeah, well, yeah. that's unfortunate because um, he was really meaning to talk about people that have been on the five-year unemployment plan. Uh, uh, you know, that's you know when you increase unemployment benefits to a hundred weeks or two hundred weeks, well, he, wherever we're at today. What he did is he just he just said I, I was a mistake and shouldn't have said it. So we don't know really exactly what he meant. We don't know who he's talking about. Yeah, I mean we don't know exactly how he meant it. He just said I disavow it. It was a mistake. It was one. It was the it was a gap. Uh, was watching the campaign. I will tell you that it was a gaff. It was a right. pretty big gaff. And c considering how intelligent uh, Governor Romney is, it's a it's a it's an interesting problem. Right. So there you go on that one. But there is one one more thing about taxes kind of interesting that there was actually a federal judge who talked about that. And he said, uh, who was that? And this is Judge Learned Hand, Helvering versus Gregory, uh, Second Circuit, 1934, 69, Fed Second, 809-810-11. And I hate to get technical on this, but it's, it's a very nice quote. Anyone may so arrange his affairs that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He is not bound to choose that pattern which will best pay the treasury. There is not even a patriarch duty to increase one's taxes. I like that. I so like this that. is actually a slap in the face of the, the Secretary of Treasury here. Because well, what's <laughs> interesting is is that our our our, our Secretary of Treasury is uh, what's his name, Radner. Or... Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I, you know why I don't even want to remember him because he's <laughs> such a he's actually came from uh, which uh, Gold, Goldwyn Goldwyn Sachs. He came from there. Which is interesting because he's saying they're too big to fail. So anyway, listen. Well, they on, are that, on that happy note, they're too big to fail. They're too big to fail. But anyway, okay. listen, Mark. Thanks for the show. Okay. Oh, wait, oh. Everyone look at uh, ah. you know, Facebook.com uh, forward slash Law Talk TV show. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs>